A half century ago, we saved a vast, undisturbed landscape from ourselves and for ourselves. The people who had the foresight 50 years ago to set aside that area was just a remarkable vision. It's a birthplace. It's a sacred place to us. There are no bridges. There are no trails. There are no signs pointing the way. It is possible to stand virtually anywhere upon it and imagine being the first person to ever step foot on that particular piece of land. From towering mountains to wild coastal plains, this particular piece of land is like few others in the world today. It symbolizes freedom, where a person can go sort of back in time. We can study natural ecological processes, everything from glaciology to vegetation change, climatology, wildlife population, reproduction and survival in a natural setting. Symbolically, it's a last frontier where nothing has changed. I've been there, I've seen it, and I have a philosophical and almost a moral and religious commitment to protect it. In the upper reaches of Alaska is an unbroken wilderness territory like no other in our nation. Some 30,000 miles square, its history, wildlife, and diverse habitats embody America's highest conservation ideals. The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. The Brooks Range. Created by a collision of tectonic plates, these luminous white mountains dominate the center of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Soaring as high as 9,000 feet, these immense limestone formations once sat waist deep in primeval oceans. Water flowing down the rock face feeds a network of rivers that support an astonishing array of wildlife and habitats. You have everything from boreal forest to, to high alpine to uh, coastal plain tundra. David Payer is lead ecologist of the Arctic Refuge. The ecological value of the refuge lies in its vastness and in its undisturbed and unmanipulated state. A wide diversity of ecoregions occur here, and each of these regions supports its unique assemblage of, of plant and animal species. Here, each June, the porcupine caribou herd, over 100,000 strong, gather to bear their young. Each summer, 147 species of birds fly from as far away as Antarctica to nest. This great natural expanse is our nation's largest wildlife refuge, roughly the size of the state of South Carolina. At its southern edges, massive stands of birch, aspen, and spruce are dissected by wetlands and south-flowing rivers that tumble from the mighty Brooks Range. To the north, lowland forests give way to a vast tundra stretching clear to the coastal lagoons of the Arctic Ocean. The geologic events that transform this land took place some 140 million years ago. The movement to preserve it 
barely registers on the geological clock. But in the timeline of humanity, the founding of the Arctic Refuge represents a seismic shift in thinking that began as our nation looked inward at the close of World War II. Well, the effort to establish the Arctic Refuge was really emerged in response to the post-war changes that American society was undergoing. Roger Kay is a wilderness specialist and an Arctic Refuge pilot. It was a very prosperous time, but Americans had developed the highest rate of environmental degradation the world had ever known. Natural areas were being lost at an unprecedented rate. Areas uh, were being lost to urbanization, resource extractive uses. There was pollution and pesticides uh, concerns. All of these came together to lead a number of Americans to really be concerned about an unprecedented rate of environmental changes. One of the most influential conservationists grew up in Iowa, an outdoorsman from day one. Aldo Leopold is best known as a celebrated author, but it was his earlier experiences as a forester in the rugged West where he developed a new brand of environmental ethics. Ethics that would become the foundation for the science of wildlife management. In his seminal book, A Sand County Almanac, he assailed our destructive use of the land and emphasized the importance of biodiversity and ecology. The outstanding scientific discovery of the 20th century is not television or radio, but rather the complexity of the land organism. In 1951, the first steps were taken to protect the wilderness that would become today's Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. National Park Service employees George Collins and Lowell Sumner began a scientific survey of the Eastern Brooks Range. The majesty and diversity they encountered would reach the public through an article they published in the Sierra Club Bulletin in 1953. The title was straightforward. Northeast Arctic, the last great wilderness. George Collins illustrated the piece with striking drawings of Arctic wildlife. Stunned by their first encounter with a vast herd of caribou, Lowell Sumner wrote, This wilderness is big and wild enough to make you feel like one of the old time explorers. We came upon whole valleys, hill slopes, ravines and tundra flats, crawling with caribou. They flowed up and down the slopes in all directions. Sumner, Collins, and their team realized that few Americans would ever be able to visit such a remote location. But they also reasoned that people might support its preservation as a part of the nation's vanishing heritage. Sumner helped identify that heritage by stressing the fundamental American ideal of freedom. He wrote of this wilderness. It symbolizes freedom, freedom to continue unhindered and forever if we are willing. The particular story of planet Earth unfolding here, where its native creatures can still have freedom to pursue their future, so distant, mysterious. Sumner and Collins then made a crucial decision. To permanently protect the wilderness heritage of Northeast Alaska, they enlisted the help of an exceptional couple, Olaus and Marty Murray. A groundbreaking biologist and author, Olaus Murray was well suited to the challenge. His wife, Marty, grew up in Fairbanks, Alaska, and was a gifted writer and communicator. Now their mission for Sumner and Collins would take them on a journey that would begin in the Arctic wilderness and would end in Washington, D.C.
In 1956, the Murrays and a research team explored the Sheenjack River Valley. We are riding from the Sheenjack country, from the Arctic wilderness of the Brooks Range, 150 miles north of Fort Yukon and the Arctic Circle, more than 2,000 miles north of Seattle. The expedition was a crucial stage in the effort to protect the area. This was the last lake up the Sheenjack River, so we named this Last Lake. And from this wonderful camp place, we had further insight into this Arctic wilderness. This is the valley of the Sheenjack River, and it's the birthplace of the Arctic Refuge. This is the place that Olaus Murray, who was president of the Wilderness Society, and Marty Murray and three other scientists came to, primarily to develop strategy for a long, hard-fought campaign to establish this as the last great wilderness. As they documented the River Valley's diverse plant and animal species, Olaus wrote, we human beings need to muster the wisdom to leave a few places of the earth strictly alone. Marty wondered if that could ever happen. Will we have the wisdom to cherish such places, to leave such parts of the earth in their natural state, to visit them humbly and with appreciation? Those working to make the Arctic refuge a reality knew the ultimate approval would have to come from the federal government. And that would only happen with public support. They needed an ally in Washington, DC. And they found one in a lofty and powerful position. The Murrays convinced Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas to join them at the Sheenjack camp. Douglas knew how Washington worked, and he was also a conservationist. After seeing the Arctic wilderness with his own eyes, he wrote, This is and must forever remain a roadless primitive area where all food chains are unbroken, where the ancient ecological balance provided by nature is maintained. Douglas threw his full support behind the refuge, but the opposition was waiting. One of the staunchest critics was Ernest Greening, U.S. Senator from Alaska. This gigantic reservation is a fantasy to satisfy some theoretical conceptions of distant men unfamiliar with Alaska. Undaunted, the Murrays reached out to everyday Alaskans and anyone else who would listen. Olas and Margaret Murray, they were my heroes. Debbie Miller is a nature writer and wilderness advocate who was inspired by the pioneering work of the Murrays. They would go give slideshows and presentations to different groups in different states, whether it was in Alaska, whether it was in Washington, D.C. Little by little, people grew to know this place through their work, through their personal conviction that this place was so wild, so special, that we should preserve it for future generations of, of wildlife, of people. The movement for an Arctic refuge picked up steam. Soon, Washington decision makers were hearing from average Americans who wanted action. The majority of the people who got involved in the campaign, wrote letters to senators and congressmen, had no notion of visiting here themselves. It was just the idea of a place that's so remote and so wild and so natural was very appealing to people. Through the efforts of conservationists, hunting clubs, writers, politicians, and everyday Americans, a seven-year struggle ended in 1960. 
Frederick Seaton, President Eisenhower's Secretary of the Interior, set aside nearly 9 million acres as the Arctic National Wildlife Range. Its preservation of wildlife, wilderness, and recreation values was unprecedented. Marty Murray said that when the good news came, it was only the second time in 40 years she'd seen her husband cry. The Muries knew that no place, including this one, would be entirely free of human influence. But the important thing for them was that this place would be free, at least, from the human intent to control or manipulate, manage, or subjugate nature for our purposes. Following this historic achievement, the movement for wilderness protection continued to grow. Four years after the founding of the Arctic Range, Congress passed the Wilderness Act of 1964. Howard Zahnheiser, one of the key architects of the act, wrote, The wilderness that has come to us from the eternity of the past, we have the boldness to project into the eternity of the future. The coming decades would see the passage of the Clean Air Act in 1970, and Endangered Species Act in 1973, among other significant federal legislation aimed at protecting the environment. Then in 1980, President Jimmy Carter signed legislation that would expand the Arctic Range and rename it the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. ANILCA, the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, actually doubled the size of the refuge to over 19 million acres, which is an area about the size of South Carolina, so it's just huge. Jeffrey Haskett was appointed as the director of the Alaska region of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 2008. The 19 million acres, you have so many different habitats. You have five different habitat groups from the Brooks Range to the Coastal Plain. It's just one of those places where the range of habitats and species make it a special place. The new law established the original 1960 range as wilderness, but section 1002 of the law called for inventory of the fish and wildlife resources and an analysis of the impacts of oil and gas exploration on the Western Coastal Plain. This area, known as the 1002 area, may not be entered for oil and gas exploration without further action by Congress and approval of the president. Until his tragic death in a plane crash, former U.S. Senator Ted Stevens argued for the responsible development of the region's energy resources. It is one of the first areas of the Arctic that was known for oil and gas, and it would have been under normal circumstances of explored and developed a long time ago. While working as a lawyer for the Secretary of the Interior in the late 1950s, Stevens played an instrumental role in the establishment of the Arctic Refuge. However, he later opposed the expansion of federal lands under ANILCA. And, like many of the Alaskans he represented, he supported exploration of oil and gas resources in the 1002 area. The 1002 area represents a compromise, really. We knew that the area had oil and gas slicks which had been discovered as early as 1919, and the area should be explored for oil and gas. And that was the concession that was made uh, to me personally by those who were backing the bill that th that area would be set aside so that there could be oil and gas exploration in the area now known as Anwar. Some residents of the village of Kaktovik 
located within the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge on the North Slope, consider oil and gas development in the 1002 area as vital to their economic future. Kaktovik village leader, Fenton Rexford. The establishment or the creation of the 1002 area, a million and a half acres of, of 19 and a half million acres, is just a minute part of the refuge that would be open to oil and gas development. And this tribal entity supports responsible development. But some Alaskans are less supportive of development in the 1002 area. Oil development was not the purpose of the refuge uh, being established in the first place. Richard Hayden is a hunter and trapper who moved to Alaska in 1960. If they did develop the oil resources up there, there would be roads, there would be pipelines, there would be airports. It would bring in a huge influx of people and that would certainly impact the caribou up there. How the debate over the 1002 area will end is unknown. What we do know is the Arctic refuge, its past, present, and future, continues to inspire visitors from around the world. Many are drawn here by the wildlife and pristine landscapes. But the true power of the refuge is greater than the sum of its parts. The Arctic Refuge is America's wildest refuge, not because half of it is congressionally designated wilderness, but because in its entirety, it serves as a single best example of a wildlife refuge largely untouched by modern human development. Ken Salazar became the U.S. Secretary of the Interior in 2009. Each visitor spends an average 11 days within the refuge while floating or hiking or hunting. Many of those who do so describe their experience as a sort of time machine because it is possible to stand virtually anywhere upon it and imagine being the first person to ever step foot on that particular piece of land. This place remains wild as it has always been and will be. The primary access to the refuge is by air. Once on the ground, visitors experience adventure, solitude, and self-reliance. Some choose rigorous backpacking treks, or challenge themselves on the wild rivers. Others visit to hunt or to simply experience the area's stark, primeval beauty. I mean, it's a great place to hunt. It's an awesome place. It's nice that it's set aside and it's, you know, considered a wilderness area. Has a good reputation. And look at it. It's pretty awesome up here. There's this freedom, openness, and just adventure. You know, you, you're, you're not in control up there. Based in Fairbanks, Carol Kaza and her husband run a wilderness guiding outfit. For 30 years, they've taken visitors hiking and rafting in the refuge. Our trips are life-transforming experiences for people. They've never been in a place that's so wild and so whole and complete. It just connects you back in with that part of your spirit and soul, I think. And just, you know, the civilized parts falls away and it, it changes people.
visitors to the refuge can also go it alone. But careful planning is crucial. You are so far removed from help. You have to prepare your mind. You have to prepare your body. Heather Bartlett is a refuge officer and pilot. Her husband, Larry, is a hunt consultant. Heather studied biology in college. She spent her summer breaks in Alaska until taking a permanent job with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 2005. The refuge is an amazing place that you can never fully learn. It's 19 million acres, and I strive to, to learn it all, but know that I never will be able to. Larry decided to spend his life here after a trip to the refuge with his father in 1996. We landed on the river and you see these aqua, teal green looking rivers and it just, it called you, you know, it just, you wanted to be a part of that. Although the Arctic refuge is almost a second home to Heather and Larry, they never really stopped being visitors. Maybe because they still see the wilderness through the eyes of newcomers. I needed to stay here a lifetime just to explore all the places that you, know, you, you can read about, that few people get to see it. Anything that you want to explore as far as big game or wilderness adventure, river experience, mountain climbing, I mean, the list goes on. It really doesn't matter how many times you go out there, you go through that same transformation every single time. You know, saying, okay, the cell phone can stay at home. I just need to let it all go and relax and just immerse myself in this place and this experience. That immersion can take so many different forms. It can, it can be a very pleasant experience, but it can also be a very negative experience. But those negative experiences you have remind you where you are and how you need to be completely self-reliant. After a trip to the refuge in 2002, Author Peter Matheson described the austere yet immersive qualities that overcome so many visitors. He wrote, This wild, free valley and the barren ground beyond is but a fragment of one of the last pristine regions left on Earth, entirely unscarred by roads or signs, indifferent to mankind, utterly silent. This land may seem silent, even foreboding to visitors, but for the native peoples of the area, it's a wellspring of culture and everyday sustenance. For thousands of years, nomadic peoples have followed the migratory routes of land and sea animals here. Today, hunting and gathering on the refuge is still the main source of food for many of their descendants. Fenton Rexford still remembers the challenges he faced as a young hunter. We had to use dogs to trap and hunt. We didn't have machines, there was no machines or mode of transportation, so everything was manual or with dog teams or by walking. Joseph Soplu continues to hunt along the coastal areas bordering the Beaufort Sea. The Arctic Refuge just helped me a lot because it brought food to my table, you know, and I, I thought maybe if it wasn't put a hold on to where you were restricted to be on it, 
so you can harvest your game, the lifestyle will be gone, I would say. The subsistence way, the, the culture. We have a responsibility for making sure that every acre of the refuge is actually managed for subsistence use, giving native peoples who have been there for thousands and thousands of years the ability to continue the lifestyle that's so important to them. Game is also vital to the people who live in isolated communities on the south side of the refuge. You look at places where there's villages, and those villages are in a place where the caribou migrate. 75, 80% of our diet is from what's out there. Arctic Village is a Gwich'in community nestled along the east fork of the Chandelar River. It's a very small village. We hunt and fish here, and uh, I've been living here all my life. Sarah James is a village spokesperson. That's my parents, Isaiah James and Martha James. Isaiah James is a Salmon Nation people, and my mother is caribou people. They're both not with us anymore, but those are my parents. Arctic National Wildlife Refuge needs to be protected uh, permanently, not only for the caribou, not only for the Kuch'en, uh, but uh, all life form. Trimble Gilbert is a traditional Gwich'in chief and year-round subsistence hunter. I grew up in the Arctic village, and uh, we know what it's coming in summer, fall time, winter time, and springtime. Four different seasons, we know what we're going to do. We know there's gonna be a lot of birds, and fish, and ducks, and caribou, and moose, and different time. But by far, the greatest source of food for Trimble's community is the caribou herd. We always been a caribou people. Even today, our diet is about 75% is wild meat. To many, the caribou has come to symbolize all wildlife on the Arctic Refuge. Acclaimed biologist George Schaller described them as living evocations of the unseen forces at work here. He wrote, the animals dominate the landscape wherever they are, a river of life always moving not only defining this Arctic ecosystem, but also symbolizing the freedom of its wilderness. Each year, great herds travel across the Canadian Yukon and Northwest Territory. Others migrate within Alaska and the refuge area. The epic journey of one caribou herd, the porcupine herd, represents one of the longest migrations of a land mammal on the face of the earth. The porcupine herd, named for the river where it originates in Canada's Yukon Territory, is the largest in the Arctic refuge. Numbering over 100,000, they journey more than 800 miles each year to and from their ancestral calving grounds on the coastal plain. In early July, they retreat from the endless clouds of mosquitoes to wintering areas south of the Brooks Range. Caribou are a prime source of food, not only for people living near the refuge. They also sustain many animals, including wolves and other large predators. Here, caribou numbers fluctuate naturally, and nature runs its course as it has uninterrupted for thousands of years. 
Many speak about this place as America's wildest refuge. The inspiration for that is this is a place where ecological processes, where evolution can continue to occur without external manipulation for future generations in perpetuity. Awaiting visitors today and generations to come is the greatest wildlife diversity of any protected Arctic area in the world. The creatures that live here year round are adapted to withstand the full range of environmental conditions. Winter is obviously a particularly challenging time, and so we see many uh, interesting adaptations uh, that, that uh, wildlife have evolved to deal with that. Being active throughout the winter, like the caribou, uh, living underneath the snow, like mice and voles, or migrating to more southerly climes. One of the largest, most primitive animals on the refuge is a consummate survivor. Along with the caribou, it's the only split-hoofed animal that survived the ice sheets and glaciers of the Pleistocene era some 10,000 years ago. The muskox. Their entire bodies are coated with fibers of fur eight times warmer than wool. Their thick coats allow them to survive the nine-month-long winters in temperatures colder than 40 degrees below zero. While they survived an ice age, musk oxen disappeared in Alaska in the 19th century. But in 1969, they were reintroduced to the refuge where they continue to roam into an uncertain future. Since 1982, we've had a, a program to monitor these animals. Patricia Reynolds is a wildlife ecologist with the Arctic Refuge. With the muskox, we've seen some very interesting uh, trends over time. At first, the population grew very rapidly after its release. By 1986, the population began to expand its range, but since about uh, 1999 or 2000, we've had a dramatic decrease in numbers of muskoxen in the Arctic Refuge itself. Federal and state researchers are looking at a number of factors that range from changes in environment to predation. One of the few creatures powerful enough to take down musk oxen are grizzly bears. For decades, these apex predators have been the focus of numerous studies and surveys. To gather vital information on their movements, Bears are tranquilized and fitted with radio collars that transmit GPS information via satellite for analysis. GPS satellite radio collars that we put on bears to learn more about their food habits. Today, three of these fell off. Some of them were up on the uh, sides of the mountains, and some of them were on the bottom of the valleys, and we picked them up in bears' natural habitats. Researchers Dick Scheidler and Harry Reynolds work with refuge managers on a number of grizzly bear surveys and studies. This particular uh, project where we're looking at the GPS collars is a cooperative one with the refuge staff. We're looking at testing the feasibility of using these GPS collars to determine food habits and feeding areas and use areas. Okay. Of course we'll find it there. That's what we're after. Just gotta follow the radio signal and take it off, do it safe, quickly, and without any harm to the bear. It's a kind of a lifetime commitment towards management of wildlife and increasing the knowledge base of wildlife so that all these wild animals are here for future generations. Getting hot, coming hot. <laughs> <laughs> 
Surveys designed to monitor animals, large and small, as well as their habitats, are conducted year-round at the refuge. The goal is to ensure the health of the entire ecosystem while still allowing visitors to experience an untouched wilderness and scientists to explore its mysteries. There are still basic things that, that aren't known about this place, and so it kind of harkens back, if you will, to that golden age of biology when biologists were also explorers and naturalists. Coming to the refuge is always an adventure. Often the work we do is expeditionary in nature. So this fence is a solar-powered bear fence. We use it to keep the bears away from our uh, cook tent areas, and we also have them around our sleep tents over here. And it works pretty good. Ornithologist Steve Kendall and his crew spend weeks at a time in tough, remote locations. I love it. I, I couldn't ask for a better job. The challenges, I guess, are the adverse weather that we have up here. As you see, the fog just rolled in, but when it's beautiful, it's, it's just incredible. There's not a better place to be. On this survey expedition, Kendall is collecting new data on shorebirds that migrate here. A lot of shorebirds come to the tundra areas here to breed, and then when they're done, they move out to the coastal areas to build up their energy reserves for their migration. So we're looking at the species, the distribution, abundance of birds that are out here. There's birds from all over the world that actually migrate to here. There's uh, the weed ears that breed in the Brooks Range. They come from sub-Saharan Africa. We have bar-tailed godwits that breed in low numbers on the Arctic Refuge, coming all the way from New Zealand and Australia. And we have birds from uh, southern South America that migrate here from all regions of the lower 48, um, the birds in the Pacific Islands. We're going to have up to two, 300,000 snow geese, so they're going to come over here and they stage on the coastal plain. Migrating birds are a stunning example of the refuge's role as a crucial link in the life cycles of animals from around the planet. Olaus Murray knew this in 1961 when he wrote that the scientific value of this wilderness area transcended man-made borders. He wrote, The Arctic range should be kept for basic scientific study, for observation, as a help to us for our understanding of the natural processes in the universe. It's heartening for me to know that the refuge has fulfilled that purpose, that it does serve as a natural laboratory in which we can study natural ecological processes. Everything from glaciology to vegetation change, uh, climatology, wildlife population, reproduction and survival in a natural setting. Over the decades, the work of refuge scientists and researchers has taken on a new global dimension. The northern part of Alaska, which includes the refuge area, is in many respects ground zero for the climate change that's grabbed the public's attention over the last several years. John Walsh is a professor of climate change and chief scientist at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Alaska has warmed at twice the rate of the rest of the United States, more than twice the rate of the rest of the world. The refuge is right in the middle of the area of maximum warming. The refuge faces a special risk due to a phenomenon known as polar amplification, a trend where higher latitude regions warm at a quicker pace than the rest of the world. I've only worked on the Arctic Refuge for seven years, but the last three years when I'm up here doing these post-breeding shorebird studies, we see no sea ice anymore. There used to be sea ice here, you know, all through into August or whatever, and, and we're seeing direct effects of that. The loss of polar bears' sea ice habitat reduces their ability to access and successfully hunt ice seals, their main prey. As the ice recedes way offshore, the polar bears uh, no longer have access to these shallow continental shelf waters where uh, resources are more plentiful.
Kaktovik resident Walt Audi has observed some of these changes. We usually have icebergs and lots of places for the seals to get on and the bears to hunt, but now they're having to swim from the ice pack, which is probably at 100, 200 and some miles right now. And uh, some of them make up, some of them don't. There are other changes in polar bear behavior linked to longer ice-free seasons. Denning on pack ice has declined significantly compared with denning along the refuge's northern coast. Scientists have also observed changes in weather patterns that affect other animals. These include midwinter icing caused by freezing rain. Freezing rain creates a layer of ice between grazing animals and the plants they're trying to feed on. Changes may occur that may make it more difficult for musk oxen to survive. And these would include, in the winter, um, freezing rain conditions and deeper snow conditions, more precipitation in winter as the temperatures warm in the winter. Even the ancient mountains of the Brooks Range are changing. The glaciers they contain have receded dramatically over the past 50 years, with the rate of ice melt accelerating in the last decade. But the importance of the refuge, its worth as a climate laboratory, its value as an untamed wilderness, are just as boundless as the challenges ahead. The greatest challenge to the Arctic refuge will likely be developing ways to protect those values as the Arctic climate warms and in anticipating those climate-induced changes in order to do so. We need to determine what those impacts are and how they will impact Arctic lands and the animals in our trust. Studies to anticipate the effects of climate change would take place in what amounts to a pristine wilderness laboratory. Based on these studies, management steps taken to address the impact of climate change could one day provide valuable insights to wildlife managers and leaders around the world. Today, the Arctic Refuge embodies the values of the National Wildlife Refuge System. The mission of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is to protect these areas, preserve the unique values they represent, and encourage Americans to experience the adventure, beauty, and solace of wilderness. Since President Teddy Roosevelt established the first wildlife refuge in 1903, more than 500 national wildlife refuges have been set aside to protect wildlife and their habitats and to provide places in which people can enjoy outdoor recreation and develop a lasting bond with the natural world. For Alaskans, this bond, tempered by open debate and deliberation, is especially strong. I'm thankful that the refuge is here. Whatever the United States is trying to do about it as far as keeping it a wilderness, you know, I'm kind of hoping that they would keep it that way. Because I, I, I like this. I mean, you know, it's an untouched. I've been emotionally connected with this uh, area uh, now for, for at least, uh, uh, what, 60 years. I appreciate it more than people realize. I also feel there's a national interest in not closing off access to some of the, of the resources of the area.
It's been said that what a country chooses to save is what a country chooses to say about itself. Nowhere in the world is that truth more evident than here in the Arctic Refuge. I've been an outdoorsman all my life, uh, a hunter, a fisherman, an explorer, a mountain climber. I've had some wonderful outdoor experiences. Nothing that I ever dreamed of could compare with my visits to Alaska, where I was able to see dull sheep and polar bears and grizzlies and musk oxen and other animals come forward and let me see the way the world was when God made it. It's a religious experience, not only for me, but for anyone who visits there and is willing to take the time and effort to find a place that exemplifies the solitude, the peacefulness, the beauty, the undisturbed nature that has been set aside in Alaska.